people who would come and they, they would be, you know, great speakers. And they would tell us about all the things that they accomplished in their life, the things that they did. But the most important thing that I always felt like when I was sitting in your shoes and bleachers like these um, was the fact that they never really told us about themselves. Like they would say, you know, this is what we're doing in business or this is what I've accomplished. But they, they didn't tell us like what their life was like, how they necessarily got there. You know, they left out the part that they started out as regular young men and young women, just like you all are. And, and I always felt the need that whenever I got into speaking, I would never be that type of individual. That I would first and foremost tell you any and everything about me, whether it be good, whether it be bad. I believe in being transparent and authentic because I don't want y'all to think this man holding this microphone is perfect. All right. I've had my flaws and I'll, I will share those with you so that you all can grow to be better in life than I was. And I want to talk to you all about goals and dreams and how you utilize that thing to help the people around you become better. Because here's the deal. It's important for you all to want things and to, to dream for things. But what's most important on top of all that is how much of a leader can you be by helping other people accomplish the goals and the dreams that they have for themselves. You have to have a we mindset instead of a me type of mindset. You're going to be going to school with individuals to the left and to the right of you for a very, very long time. So treat each other with respect. Value your teachers. OK, tell your parents that you love them. There's something great about saying yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. Those things. No, sir. and Yes, sir. They will take you so far in life. You can't even imagine. It, and those are simple. Does not take a genius to do those things. All right. So respect one another. Also, in talking about goals and dreams, I felt like a lot of people made the mistake of not clearly defining the two of them. Like there's a difference between dreams and goals. Y'all understand that, right? Like a dream and a goal are not the same thing. Dreams are something that is your ultimate. Like it's what you want to do with your life. You want to be an actress. You want to be a singer. You want to be a gymnast. You want to be a famous athlete. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be a preacher. You want to be a teacher. Look, those are all dreams. But what goals are, goals are the steps that you have to take in between all of that to accomplish your dream. All right. So have a dream, but also have the mindset to understand that you got to set some goals for yourself. And I need one volunteer very quickly. Now that you understand the difference between dreams and goals, come up here, young dear, and tell me your dream. All right, really quickly, this is important. I want you all to give her your undivided attention. And the reason being is because public speaking, speaking in front of crowds, speaking in front of people is the number one fear in the world. OK, so it's the number one fear. She's stepping out of her comfort zone and doing it. So first and foremost, come here, come close. I ain't going to bite you. I ain't going to bite you. What's your name? Margaret. Miss Margaret. I'm Tyler. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What is your dream, my dear? Uh, I want to. I don't know. Girl, you gotta have a dream. Uh. Nothing. Girl, go sit down. <laughs> All right. Listen, Margaret, great job. You right here in the blue. What is your first name? Just stand up. Tell me your first name. Give me a dream. Carly. Miss Carly, don't be nervous. I ain't gonna bite. I didn't bite her. I ain't gonna bite you. Give me a dream. Your dream. You wanna be a singer? Hey, you better sing, girl. All right. So sit down, listen, listen to me, listen to me very closely. The faster that you understand your dream, the faster you understand your dream, the greater, the faster you can get to establishing your purpose in life. And once you establish your purpose in life, it will bring the gateway in which you can be the best version of yourself and it will bring an opportunity to help the masses around you. Okay. So be the greatest singer that you can be and work on singing each and every day. Promise? All right, so I told you I'm going to give you a little background and backdrop about me. Okay? I grew up on 2937 Thousand Oaks Drive in Austin, Texas, right down the road. You heard that. My father, his name is Earl. My mother, her name is Renee. I have an older brother by the name of Christian. As a matter of fact, if you go into that gymnasium, you'll see all these track and field records up there. My brother is the one who has three of them established in 1997. Okay? So, yeah. So, very athletic family. My father, Earl, is an NFL Hall of Famer a Heisman Trophy winner, and an official state hero here in the state of Texas. And what I mean by state heroes, we have four. My dad is the only living one that we have. 
The other three, you all know. There's Stephen F. Austin, Stam Houston, and then there's Davy Crockett. The fourth living legend here or hero in the state of Texas is my father, Earl Campbell. So you all should be actually being learning about him in school because he's an official state hero. So no pressure, right? Okay? There's no pressure to be an athlete. So listen to me very closely. Listen in. I fell in love with the game of football at a very, very early age in my life, as you can imagine. I started playing football for the first time in the seventh grade here at Hill Country, and I was absolutely horrible at it. Um, I was terrible. Uh, as a matter of fact, it got a little bit better in the eighth grade, uh, but not so much. Not so much. And um, it's so competitive here in EISD that I actually uh, ended up kind of becoming more introverted. You know, as you can see, you know, I'm, I'm an African-American male. Not a lot of black males go or black students go to this school. And on top of that, EISD is very, very competitive. And what it caused me to do, because I wasn't that good at sports at that particular time, um, and because I wasn't necessarily the smartest student, it caused me to be introverted. It caused me to kind of isolate myself. And over time, I literally started to believe that I was unintelligent as a young man. And I gave my academics less attention. And for somebody in this room, you're kind of going through the same thing right now. You're, you know, things are moving so fast and you're afraid to ask questions. You're afraid to kind of speak up for yourself or step out of your comfort zone. I want you to know that you're looking at somebody who's going through the same exact things that you went through. But one day I made up my mind, I made up my mind that, you know what? I'm not going to settle for being just okay at football. I'm going to be the best athlete that I could possibly be. And when I got to Westlake High School, I started, things started to click as a freshman, but my sophomore year I actually made varsity. I didn't play on varsity as a sophomore, but I ended up having knee surgery, but my junior year, my junior year because of the hard work and dedication of my teammates, because in life you will never accomplish anything by yourself. Hear me closely. You will never accomplish anything in life by yourself. There are always going to be people who are strategically placed along your path to help you accomplish your goals and your dreams. It may be your parents, it may be friends, it may be your teachers, but you're never ever alone. I ended up becoming the number two running back in the entire state of Texas after my junior season because of my hard work and dedication of my teammates. Number one, fellas, was a man by the name of Adrian Peterson who's in the NFL right now. He was the number one running back when I was coming out of high school and I was number two. The amazing thing about that was that scholarships started rolling in and college literally began to be my discussion as a junior. Full ride scholarships in which I knew I knew that I was going to be able to go to college. Like my, most of my peers were still trying to figure out where they were going to school. Here I was, the kid who wasn't the smartest in the world, and I actually already had full ride scholarships to go to college for free as a junior at the age of 16. Um, the only problem with all those accolades was I was living a double life. And what I mean by that is the person who I was during the day was not the same person I was when the sun went down. Alcohol was like one of my, one of my biggest friends. And it was because I always looked for an outlet because I wasn't happy with the individual that I saw in the mirror. And that decision cost me. My selfishness, it cost me. At the age of 16, during my junior year in the off season, our high school, Westlake High School, was playing the crosstown rival, Austin High High School, and I showed up there after consuming alcohol. Police officers, they smelt alcohol in my breath, my breath upon entering the gymnasium. And while the, while the game was going on, police officers made their way in front of the bleachers like I am right now, and they pointed to me in front of a sold out crowd for everybody to see. And I knew that my life was about to be forever changed. After all the processing and all those things, I can remember finally getting in front of my parents and my mother, my queen, the woman that I held on the most high, who did an excellent job, her and my father both raising me. I had to look at my mother and explain to her why I made the decision that I made. And my mother was crying tears of never ending waterfalls. I'm 31 years to this day, I'm 31 years old. There's been a lot of death that I've seen in the family. There's been a lot of hurt in family, life. I've never seen my mother cry the same way she did when I was 16 years old. My father was so dejected and so disturbed that he could not even look me in the eyes when he talked to me. And you have to understand, my mother and my father, first generation college students in their family, first ones to go to college. My father came from a family of 11, 18 people lived in his home in a three bedroom shack. My father lost his dad when he was 11 years old. His mother raised all of them by, them, by themselves, by herself. Everything that I had in life was because of the hard work and dedication of my parents. A roof over my head, clothes on my back, food on the table. I never had anything to worry about. 
I was privileged. Y'all, this is a great school district, EISD. Do you understand that there are resources that you all see on a regular basis that most kids across this country could only dream of? So when you recognize where you come from and you recognize how fortunate enough you are, please take hold of your day and get the most out of it. Don't take anything for granted because somebody would give to be in your shoes. Somebody would give to have clothes without holes in them. Somebody would give to have parents who love them. All right, so here I was and I was privileged. And when I started to recognize all those things that my parents provided for me, yo, it rotted me to my core with guilt. Administration had made the decision since I was young, I was a minor. On top of that, I was on school grounds and oh yeah, I had consumed alcohol. I had to enter into the alternative education system. I wasn't allowed to go to school at Westlake because of all those things. When colleges came by that spring to come see me and check in on me and how I was doing, I wasn't there. My father made me call every single Division I college coach, whether they recruited me, offered me a scholarship or not, and explain to them what I had just gotten in trouble for. And it was literally like every phone call that I made, I could feel myself speaking away my future. Like you could hear every coach kind of just like sigh, like, <sighs> like they had no idea. My future was in jeopardy. But I vowed from that moment forward that I would get my wrongs right and that I would work to be the best possible version of myself each and every day. Didn't matter about being the best athlete, didn't matter about being the best student. I was just going to be the best me that I could possibly be. And that is a choice that each and every one of you can make. It does not matter what you've been through, doesn't matter what you're going through. You yourselves can control your mindset. And if you wake up every day choosing to be the best, I promise you will accomplish anything you want to accomplish. You'll help people along the way and you will make your family proud. And more, more times than not, you'll be happy with the, ver the face that you see staring back at you every day in the mirror. I was going to work hard. I disappointed my parents, I disappointed my teammates, I embarrassed my family. I started doing tour days on my own. I wasn't allowed to work out with the rest of the team, I wasn't allowed to be at Westlake High School, so I still had this dream of playing college football, not to mention my mama had like grounded me for life. So I couldn't do anything, but what she would allow me to do was run the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, as I got further along in my punishment and I started getting my life together, she would let me run to Cedar Creek Elementary and I'll work out on the backfields. Not the, not the side fields that, that are right there on the side street. Y'all know the backfields where you would have sports day and everything like that. I'd work out back there when the elementary school wasn't in, so nobody would see me. And I vowed that I would come back to school in the best shape of my life if administration let me come back with the student body. So I remember meeting in front of the board and we went over my punishment and all the things, my curriculum to make sure that I was following uh, what they had in store for me. As a matter of fact, I got ahead. I become uh, so focused on my academics that I was ahead. For the very first time in my life, I made up the decision to say, you know what, I'm going to apply myself in academics the same way I apply myself, I mean the same way I apply myself on the football field in the academic setting. So I'm going to give it the same attention just to see what happens. And what happened was, y'all, I ended up getting all A's. When I came back at the closure of my junior year, I would already learned everything everybody else had learned. Uh, I already learned what everybody else was learning as they were juniors. So I was ahead. Like, I was literally, like, twiddling my thumbs in class, like, teach. I already know all of this stuff. I was starting to teach the people who were around me what to do because I already knew. And I recognized, you know what? I am intelligent. I am smart. I do have what it takes. I just have to apply myself. So I get back to Westlake High School. I started putting myself through, through workouts long before that. I would do two a days and I'd work out on the east side of Austin with the Austin Striders Track Club because I knew I had to earn back the respect of my teammates. So I get back and they named me captain. I, under, I, I like earned their respect. Had one of the greatest football seasons I had had in my tenure at Westlake. As a matter of fact, I think I still have the record at Westlake High School for the longest run from scrimmage, which was 99 yards. The only problem with all of that was that my phone never rang from college recruiters the same way it did when I was a junior. But it didn't matter to me because I had this scholarship on the table from San Diego State University. I had always wanted to go there. Like I wanted to get as far away from Texas and go someplace where they didn't have no mosquitoes. <laughs> All right? I always heard about the beach, but I had never really seen one. You know what I'm saying? I heard they had a lot of those in California. So I called the coach at San Diego State University. I said, coach, I'm ready to commit. I'm ready to be an Aztec. I want to wear that red and black. And he said, Tyler, you're not going to believe this. We thought you were going to Texas A&M, so we don't have any more scholarships available. You can't come to school here. I was like, man, 
okay, okay, maybe that's just life's way of telling me I wasn't supposed to go to California. So I pick up the phone, I call a host of other schools. I call a and I call other places like that, and only to hear things like, Tyler, we don't think you're good enough, or we don't have any more scholarships available, or we thought you were going to another school. We don't have any room. I had no more scholarships left on the table at that particular time. I was the only member of the Texas Top 100 list of football players that year that didn't sign a letter of intent when February came around. Oh, by the way, there was a scholarship that opened up from Baylor University. The coach came down, he met with my family and I, sat in our room, ate the food, fixed an amazing peanut butter and honey sandwich for him. And I told him to give me two days because I wanted to sit on this decision. It's the biggest decision I've ever made in my life. You know where I'm gonna spend the next four years of my life. I told him I would call him in two days to tell him, you know, if I wanted to come to Baylor or not. And I remember getting out of Westlake in the fine arts facility. I was walking into the parking lot to get to my car and I called the coach and I said, coach, I'm ready to be a Baylor bear. And he said, Tyler, you're not going to believe this. We don't have any more scholarships available. The kid um, committed last night, another running back. We can't offer you. I had nowhere to go to school. I had no backup plan. And this is Westlake, right? So by the time you'll notice this, by the time y'all become seniors, you know, everybody in Westlake knows where they're going to school. Here I was, the token athlete, and I had nowhere to go to school. It was embarrassing. Now, because I did take care of my academics and my mama was on me just in case football never worked out, I did get accepted to the University of Houston and the University of Arizona. Like, she was like, apply to colleges. I was like, mama, you're not a part of college. I'm going to get a full ride scholarship. Why am I doing this? She said, boy, apply to college. And I literally took a dart and I threw it at the map of the United States. One landed on Houston and one landed in Arizona. So I applied to the University of Arizona and I applied to the University of Houston. And I got accepted to both. But I wasn't going to accept those, those letters of, 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 uh, of uh, acceptance as students. I wasn't going to do that because you have to understand everything that I put my parents through, I did not want them paying for my education. Like I felt like it was the least that I could do as their son to not have to worry about me and my education because I had made the mistake. So I didn't decide to walk on. Like I wanted to play football and I didn't want to do it as a walk on. I wanted a scholarship. And it was in that moment that I was recognizing that in life, young people, you're going to want some things. You're going to want to do some things. You have goals in your dreams, but you will come across a time and a point in which you're going to be stretched by life, where you're going to be challenged by life, where you're going to be tested by life to see how serious it is that you really want what you aspire for yourself. And I was being tested. Like, Tyler, you want to play football? Okay, well, you want to play football after you go through everything that's taken away from you. Will you still keep persevering? And it's in those moments of your goals and dreams, you're gonna to have to learn to count the small blessings in your life. And here's what I mean by small blessings. One day as we were getting ready to graduate from high school, you know, graduation was coming up. I still had no place to go to school. My coach hands me a business card and on that business card it says Pasadena City College, a junior college in Pasadena, California. And I was like, man, that's a small win. Because in my mind, I figured, yo, if I didn't get a scholarship to San Diego State, at least I could go to school in Pasadena, California at a junior college and ultimately earn a scholarship to San Diego State University. And so I was hyped, I was geeked, I ran home, I, called, I told my mama, I was like, mama, let's go, to, let's go to Pasadena, we gotta see this junior college. And I'm so thankful my mama believed me, we got on a flight by Southwest, went to go see the junior college, I saw palm trees for like the first time. It was so cool, no mosquitoes, they had In-N-Out Burger. I, like, I was like, yes, I love this place. And sometimes when you're excited about something in life, young people, it doesn't mean the rest of the world is going to be excited about what you're excited about. All right. Some of y'all have been through some things like you've gotten some great news about something, but then you went to go tell one of your friends and they weren't excited about it. And you like, how can you not be excited? How? I don't understand. So that was what was happening to me. Everybody wanted to be the first one to break the story of where Earl Campbell's son was going to go to school. All these newspapers, all these, all, these, all these services of recruiters. And I can remember telling myself, I'm going to tell the first person that calls me where I'm going to school. And the person called me and I said, man, I'm going to go to Pasadena City College in Pasadena, California. I'm going to be a Pasadena City College Lancer. And he was like, for real? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, isn't that great? I get to still play football. I'm going to a junior college. He's like, Tyler, why don't you just go walk on at a major D1 university? You'll earn a scholarship over time. Just go walk on. And that was my first understanding. You got to walk to the beat of your own drum. Whatever you want to do in life, it does not matter what everybody else thinks. All that matters is what you think. So I get to Pasadena City College and I get there. I get hurt the second game of the season. Sideline with a shoulder injury for the entire year. 
And maybe some of you in the audience are battling depression right now. Like you might not say it publicly, but internally you go through depression. I've been there. Because when football got taken to me once again, I was like, man, what am I doing out here? I'm not even going to get out of bed to go to class. And at times I just stayed in bed and just cried because I was like, man, I thought this was what I was supposed to do. And I made a mistake. But my mother, and my father, they never gave up on me. And it took their frequent phone calls to remind me of the first lesson I learned in life, which is that a Campbell never, ever quits. OK, it's not about how smart you are. Not about how talented you are in whatever it is that you do. What matters the most is that you never quit. Why? Because if you quit at one thing, you'll quit at everything for the rest of your life. So you can never, ever allow yourselves to quit. Stay focused and keep pushing. You will break through the wall that is in front of you. But you can't do it if you quit before you get there. So I got back to work. I thought about my time in alternative school. Okay? I started waking up at 4.30 in the morning. I'd run the track at Pasadena City College in the pitch black. When the lights went on in the weight room, I'd go in there and lift weights. Then I'd go to school all day, come back in the afternoon and work out with the rest of the football team. And on Saturdays, I'd run a notorious hill outside of Rose Bowl Stadium. I was putting in the work because I knew a blessing in my life would come as long as I put in the work. And what ended up happening was that one day, we were having some seven on seven drills, getting ready for the following football season and out walked my coach. And with that coach was a man that had the letters on his chest that stood that said S-D-S-U, that stood for San Diego State University. I knew those markings. So that day in drills, I caught every single pass that was thrown my way and I scored multiple touchdowns. A few weeks from that day, I had a scholarship offer in the mail from San Diego State University for a ride. On top of all that, I enrolled four weeks just in time for the football season. Never give up on your goals and your dreams because you don't know what's working on behind the scenes. And the crazy thing is the scholarship opened up because there was a young man. He fell through the cracks because he got in trouble for alcohol. So that's how my scholarship opened up. A young man who made the same mistake I made when I was 16 years old. So I get to San Diego State University. I am happy. They still got In-N-Out Burger down there. They have a place called Mission Beach. It was amazing. Okay, I'm learning how to surf, really dope. Not good at it, but I liked it, okay? <laughs> so I made it a point, I made up my mind. By this point in my mind, I started to understand that I was a good person, okay? I love, I love life and I love people. So I promised myself that every day in San Diego, I would wake up with a smile on my face. My teammates would ask me, they'd say, yo, TC, why do you smile so much? And I would tell them, yo, if you had went through what I went through to get to San Diego State University, I promise, I promise that you would be smiling too. My brother, you broke your femur? Um, just my All right, man, don't give up on that thing. Give me some dap. I know it's dark right now, but don't get some, give me some dap. So don't give up. So here I'm at San Diego State University, okay? I told you my academics were a struggle, but my, I made up the mindset that I would always give it my best. I struggled here in EISD. When I got to the Mountain West Conference and going to school at San Diego State University, I made all academic, all Mountain West Conference. And I had nothing less than a 3.2, 3.3 GPA as an athlete taking about 18 hours a semester. For those of you who don't know, that's a lot. Being an athlete, that's a lot. But you would never know that based off of what I've come from in EISD in my history. But when I made up my mind to excel academically, there was nothing that I could do. I graduated early with my business degree. Started my master's in public administration from somebody who couldn't stand school. I graduated college early. How crazy is that? So it was at that point that life was going so good that I had to be tested. And y'all know this. Sometimes life can be going so good, but then all of a sudden something will counter your life and it'll bring you down to the bottom. Well, here I was about to encounter something. My junior season, after playing BYU University, last game of the season, a month after my 21st birthday, I went to sleep that night normal. I woke up out of bed, and instead of rising to my feet, I fell flat on my face. There was paralysis on the right side of my body. I couldn't feel anything. I asked my arms and my limbs to move, and they wouldn't. I had slurred speech. I couldn't talk, and I couldn't walk. My equilibrium was totally off. All I could do was stay motionless and wait till my roommate, Matt, got up. And when I heard him get up, I yelled for him, Matt, I need you. Go to the training room. They had no idea what it was. 
I ended up getting sent to La Jolla Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla, California. Great place to visit, amazing views. I just didn't want to see it from a hospital bed. So we get there, and I see a neurologist. And immediately, immediately, she looks at me with open eyes because I'm this huge, you know, fit athlete. And she's like, what are you doing here? You're too young. And I told her, I said, ma'am, to be quite honest, I don't know what I'm doing here either, but I hope you can help me. So she says, I'm going to give you a spinal tap. And what a spinal tap is is where you take a needle about this long and you stick it into your spinal cord and you pull out the spinal fluid, right? But it was through that test... Listen to me, it was through that test that I learned that I have an autoimmune disease that probably many of you are familiar with called multiple sclerosis. Okay, and what was unique about that was that it's classified as a Caucasian woman's disease. But here I am, but listen, the crazy thing is I have no history of that in my family as a black male and as an athlete in the best of shape. But here I was and I contracted this disease. And my only question with that was, I asked the lady, can I still play football with the disease? And she said, you know what? I've never had an athlete with the disease before. So as long as you continue to be okay and take your medication, we'll let you continue to play football. And I was like, man, all right, that's all I needed to hear. But remember I told you I was an introverted person. I didn't really open up to that many people. So I never wanted anybody to feel sorry for me with what I had going on with multiple sclerosis. So I did all my needle injections and medications behind closed doors where nobody could see them. So none of my teammates knew about the disease except, except for my roommate, Matt. All right? So I'm, here I am. I'm young. Graduate early. Things are going great. But now I got this disease called multiple sclerosis. But I never gave up and I never quit. I played fullback when I was in college. All of our running backs got hurt. I ended up coming on and playing running back the last four games of the season. And I can remember the first game I got to play in, we were playing BYU. We were getting blown out. But I had three carries for 40-something yards. And my name for the first time was on SportsCenter. And I called my mom. I was like, Mama! She was like, did y'all win? I was like, no, but my name's on SportsCenter. And I was like, oh, man, okay, so I think I can play pro football. I, I can play pro football. So I ended up getting my body in elite shape because I gained enough confidence. I was like, man, if I get my body in shape, I can play ball. So I ended up, you know, dropping the weight, getting ready for what they call a pro day, which is where you work out for NFL scouts. And if the NFL scouts like what they see, you get an opportunity in the National Football League. So I was looking good, y'all. Oh, I was looking good. I had muscles. I had biceps, triceps, six packs. It was like amazing. Okay. Shannon Tatum, Ty Tyrese Gibson, they had nothing on your boy TC. I had it going on. I had it going on. I was like that good looking chocolate drop. Boom. It was great. Okay. So it goes a little something like this. You go through tests. And what I ended up doing was I bench pressed 225, 225 pounds. I bench pressed it 24 times. I had a 38-inch vertical, and I ran a subpar 40 at about 4.65, but remember, I could play two positions. I played fullback and running back. I could be 235, or I could be 215 or 220. And after that day, I had the chance to talk to NFL scouts, and I really and truly felt like, felt like I had an opportunity to go because Arian Foster, who was a Houston Texans running back, he was at my pro day. And I figured, like, the way I perform, everybody came to look at Arian Foster, Perhaps if they came and looked at this beautiful looking chocolate drop over here, <laughs> I might get a chance too. All right? So I got to talk to scouts and it was awesome. But we talked about highs and lows, right? The following week after that, I had a relapse of multiple sclerosis. Same situation. Get out of bed, fall on my face. But I didn't worry because I knew what to do. I had a protocol to follow. Okay? So I end up getting to the hospital, another spinal tap, get to, get to the room. And the doctor comes in and he says, you know what, Tyler, this is your last time playing football. And I was like, man, really? But at the same time, it was crazy because like a peace came over my body to where I understood like, yo, I had done very good with multiple sclerosis. And I felt like, I felt like really and truly something else was about to open up in my life. I just didn't understand what it was. You see, sometimes you're going to have goals in your dreams. You're going to fall short. You're going to feel like you're so close and it's going to be taken away from you and there's nothing that you can do about it. But it's in those moments, it's in those moments that I'm telling you that something good is coming around the corner that you can't see. And what was good that was coming around the corner that I couldn't see was this. I learned that I was the first person to ever play Division I college football with the disease multiple sclerosis, meaning that I gave hope to other boys and girls who are your age to believe that they can accomplish whatever it is that they set their minds to. So it was bigger than just me. 
When I became an ambassador, I started traveling around giving messages of inspiration for people who have multiple sclerosis. I waited till my senior year to take freshman speech. Here I am holding the microphone because I had fear of talking in front of people. But now I'm helping out more people than I ever could, you know, as far as holding a pigskin. I'm doing it way better here now with this. So all I want to tell you is that never give up, stay persistent. I want to tell you this, doctors told my wife and I that it would be difficult for us to have children, right? Because of what I was going through and things that my wife was going through. Never let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. My wife and I are happily married, we have two children. All because we continue to believe in ourselves. I want you all to look out for each other. I want you to never give up on yourselves and never give in. I always told you I'm about real life and real talk. So what I want to do really quickly is show you some pictures of proof so that you can know that everything that I'm telling you is the honest to God truth. So you see these pictures. My father, top left corner. Top right, my mother, my father, my brother and I. That handsome little baby getting coddled, that's me. That's your boy TC. Told you went through Hill Country Middle School, that's me taking one knee. All right, Westlake High School, furthest to the right. That was me. Played at SDSU, it checks out. That's me when I was playing ball at San Diego State University. This is my wife. My wife is a better athlete than me. <laughs> Amazing athlete, was almost like a freshman All-American in the long jump and triple jump. Far better athlete than me, that's my wife Shana and I. I told you about children. My wife Shana, my daughter Cheyenne, and my son Messiah. That's our family. All because we believed in each other and we said that no matter what, we're never going to give up. We're going to have children. We're going to have an amazing family. That's us. I told the sixth graders about this. No dream can be accomplished if you don't first and foremost believe in yourself. Then once you believe in yourself, be willing to overcome the adversity. When you overcome the adversity, come up with a strategy for yourself that you can implement every day to chase your goals and your dreams and then be ready to sacrifice. Listen to me, nothing can be accomplished in your life if you don't sacrifice something. You're gonna to have to give up something to make way for your goals and your dreams. I don't know if it's gonna be talking to your boyfriend late at night, ladies. I don't know if it's you being on the cell phone. I don't know if it's you being on your tablets or your computers, but you're gonna to have to give up something to make room for you to accomplish your goals and your dreams. So B-O-S-S, -S, what does that spell? Believe, overcome, strategize, and sacrifice. Listen to me very closely because it's very short. I want you all to know this. I travel the country talking to boys and girls just like yourselves. I have this story available on YouTube. You look it up. It's TC Speaks, My Journey. And it was a speech I also gave at Westlake High School, the high school you're going to be going to. There are a host of videos on my YouTube page. For those of you who feel like you're, lo you're alone, you're never alone. Your teachers are gonna get you a survey during your advisory times or whenever that takes place. I want you to fill out those surveys of honesty. It helps me to become a better person because I wanna know what it is that I can do to better help young men and young women who are in your, your position across the country. Visit my website, I'm at TC Speaks. I'm very easy to find. If you feel like something needs to be said and you don't wanna say it in the survey, my email is tyler at tcspeaks.com. I love each and every one of you. I look forward to watching you accomplish great things in this world. Be respectful to one another. Be kind to one another. Tell your parents that you love them. All the girls, I want you to stand up very quickly. All the girls, stand up very quickly. Don't say anything. Listen to me. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Listen to me very closely. Fellas, don't say anything. Listen to me very closely. This is quick because we're running close on time. I want all my ladies to repeat after me. Say, I am beautiful. I am intelligent, I am intelligent. And, I'm and I'm going to change the world. Don't let anybody else tell you any differently, ladies. Y'all be seated to my fellas. Y'all stand up. <laughs> fellas, stand up. No talking, no talking, no talking, no talking. Listen in, listen in, listen in to my fellas. Repeat after me. Say, I am handsome. I am handsome. Say, I am intelligent. I am intelligent. And I'm going to change the world. Now listen to me very closely, young men. You treat these ladies the same way that you want somebody to treat your mother or the same way that you want somebody to treat your sisters. 
If you see people being disrespectful to young ladies, I need you all to step in and tell them that it's not acceptable. All right? Treat each other with respect. Y'all remain seated, and that's my time. How much time do you have left? Not really any. Okay, good. Yeah. So they can send you a question. Yeah, let's give it up for Tyler Campbell. All right. Hey, listen, guys. We're running a little short on time. Thank you so much for being great listeners. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask Mr. Campbell, his email address is there. We don't have time for questions today, but I guarantee you he will respond back to you. Now, because we are short on time, I'm going to have this group right here.